Hey everybody, it's nice to see you tonight. This is my normal self tonight, so I'm not dressed up for you. So you just get to see me, Karen Q. Um, but thank you for joining me for this commemoration. I'm gonna wait just a couple minutes to see if more people would like to join us. And um, hi, Margo and Bernadette, Gary, Pat, Ellen, Keenan, Dick over here on Zoom. I wasn't originally going to be on Zoom tonight, but I am because I had a change of plans and how I decided to do this. Hi, Howie. So thanks for everybody for coming out tonight. Um, hi, Margo and Satakit. Oh, tonight is a truly incredible night in American history. We're gonna talk about it and um, commemorate it together. I was originally going to live stream from the spot where it happened in lower Manhattan across from Brooklyn Heights, but due to circumstances beyond my control, meaning no car, and I didn't wanna be on the subway after dark because unfortunately we are in that kind of New York City again, where you don't wanna be on the subway probably after dark, especially on a Sunday when it's kind of deserted. Um, I decided to do a commemoration from here in a live stream for you instead. But I do have some video to show you and some pictures and prints so that we can, uh, you know, get into what happened and, you know, why we should all learn about tonight in American history. And unfortunately, for whatever reason, we don't. So August 29th, 1776, a night we should all learn about in American history. And most of my friends who have studied military history actually have um, more chance to have learned about this night than those of us who actually learn American history in high school or college. And that is uh, Washington's miraculous um, escape by water from General Howe, commander of the Crown's armies in America um, during the battle for New York. But before we get into um, how all that happened and why, let's talk about what's been going on for the last week in 1776 New York. And of course, as always, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to enter them. I can see your comments here on both um, Facebook and YouTube. And for those of you who are here on Zoom, I can see those as well. So be sure to you know, let me know if you have any questions or comments as we go through these events. I'm happy to answer them. So what's been going on in New York City for the last week in 1776? So let's say starting with August 22nd, a week ago. Well, the battle for New York or the battle of New York was begun by General William Howe when he invaded Brooklyn from Staten Island. Now, what's going on in 1776? I mean, the thing we all learn about is the Declaration of Independence, Philadelphia, and all of that is incredibly important to American history. So I don't want to belittle any of that but the other thing that's going on is the battle for New York. As the British know that they need a forward operating base if they are going to fight in the colonies. And I'll uh, say I have a nice comment here. Jan, thank you so much. I do work hard to put these together and I'm so glad to see you enjoy it and appreciate it. Um, so so the, the British need a forward operating base, right? They can't, they can't fight the colonies from England. They have to fight the colonies from somewhere in the colonies and in their meetings in the parliament and their um, minister of war, Lord Germain, they have gotten together and identified the island of Manhattan as being prime geostrategic location for them. That if they can take Manhattan, they have an incredible base of operation. Think about the layout of the colonies at the time. Manhattan Island, colony of New York, is almost right in the middle of the colonies, and we are right on the Atlantic Ocean. You don't have to travel up any other waterways to get into, to get to Manhattan, and we have a deep water port, easy to house the fleet, and to get into that deep water port, there are actually two narrow things you have to pass through. On the outside of the port, on the Atlantic Ocean side, are two arms that come together that we call Sandy Hook. You have to come through there. Then you have to come around Staten Island, between Staten Island and Brooklyn, through what is called the Narrows. If you defend Sandy, um, Sandy Hook and you defend the Narrows, no one can get into that deep upper harbor where you would put your fleet. So it's easy to defend if you have a Navy. And of course, Britain has a great Navy in 1776. The other thing about New York are the two waterways, 
The Hudson River gives you access up into the interior of New York and on up into Canada. And the um, East River, which is really a part of the Long Island Sound and gives you direct access to Long Island and New England. So in 1776, the British are going to put all their resources into New York, or as the Admiral of the Navy, Lord Richard Howe will call it, the full force and fury of the British Empire. And no one wanted to see the full force and fury of the British Empire at that time in history, but New Yorkers will see it, as will Washington's army. So they are going to amass everything and send it over here, both in on the ground manpower and naval power. Now, Washington figuring out that the British are going to need New York um, begins moving his army from Massachusetts into New York in early 1776. So by the summer, he is positioned on Manhattan Island. And some of you might know that his headquarters was at number one Broadway. Any of you who watched or came on our July 9th um, reenactment um, saw me as Mrs. Q speaking to the commander right at One Broadway, his, um, his headquarters. So that would be at One Broadway by the Bowling Green and, and right at that time on New York Harbor. So General Washington is on Manhattan with say about 10 to 12,000 men. And he has some men over in Brooklyn as well. General Howe is on Staten Island with about 22,000 soldiers and they are well-trained, well-equipped, experienced professional soldiers. Um, General Washington's army, you know, are all volunteers. Some of them have some military experience, many do not. Most have shown up with their home weapon that they own dressed in whatever clothes they have carrying their belongings with them. So they are poorly trained and uh, poorly disciplined, but they have a lot of spirit. Right. Um, in July, the naval fleet arrived, the British fleet. And John Holt told, tells us, I think it's in the August 26th issue of his newspaper, which, by the way, is the last issue of Mr. Holt's newspaper um, before the war breaks out. Um, he tells us that there are about 500 ships of sail that have arrived as well, carrying approximately 20 to 22,000 more soldiers, giving the British about what, 44, 45,000 soldiers, both British and Hessian mercenaries, 500 ships against Washington's volunteers. So uh, defending New York is looking really sad by the time July rolls around. Now, Washington and his men really believed that General Howe would attack straight from Staten Island onto Manhattan Island and were busy throughout the summer fortifying the bottom tip of Manhattan Island. But that's not what General Howe did at all. He made his attack on Manhattan through Brooklyn. So one week ago on August 22nd, General Howe started the Battle of New York when he sailed from Brooklyn to Staten Island, right about where the Verrazano Bridge is today. And he landed about 20,000 men in Brooklyn. So that begins the Battle of New York. Now, at first, General Washington thought that that landing, when he got word of it, was uh, a distraction. You know, the old distract your enemy with a small battle while you're um, massing for a bigger battle somewhere else. So he initially thought that was the distraction and he went over himself to see it and realized that that was the landing. So Washington got additional soldiers into Brooklyn and the Battle of uh, Long Island or today people call it the Battle of Brooklyn, they like to call it that, has now been raging for one week, which has been primarily Washington's men fighting the best they're able, losing and retreating and fighting and losing and retreating. Um, now, two days ago, a pivotal battle in the Battle of Long Island took place at what we call the Old Stone House near uh, Park Slope area, I think of Brooklyn today. And uh, I have a, a YouTube video, and I think I reposted that video a couple of days ago on Facebook and YouTube for you, um, that I took at the Old Stone House about the significance of that battle, and that Major General William Alexander, Lord Sterling, along with 400 Marylanders and a regiment of Pennsylvania riflemen held off thousands of uh, Howe's men, most of them Hessians. Uh, many of those men died. I think most of those men died in the battle and Sterling himself was taken prisoner and was exchanged back to Washington later in the year. That, at that, that stand though allowed the remainder of Washington's army and Washington and his commanders to retreat further into Brooklyn Heights. So by the time the morning of August 29th comes around, General Washington is in Brooklyn Heights and he is completely surrounded by General Howe's massive invasionary army. 
And I have a video here for you that I did some time ago explaining from Manhattan what is going to happen next. So I'm going to show you the video. And as usual, if you have any questions or comments as it plays, um, go ahead and enter them. I will be watching the video along with you. And when it's finished, we'll talk some more. So give me a moment here to find that video for you uh, because I watched it again and it's so good. It's better for you to watch that video than to listen to me say it again. Plus it does take place right on the East River. So let me find this for you. Well, I don't think that video is playing for you guys. I think you're still just seeing the start screen of it. So I am going to, I'm going to try starting it again. As you know, this kind of stuff happens to me all the time. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't play, I will just explain to you what was going on in it. So let me find it again. Yeah, let me let me find it again. Hold on, just give me a second here and let me start it up again. and Lower Manhattan, site of one of the most important events of the American Revolution on August 29th, 1776. So if we try to pretend that this is August 29th, 1776, well, it's raining like it is today, so that. And it looks to me again. Oh, there it goes. There's quite a, a much longer delay than I expected there. I'm going to try this one more time and show you the proper screen. Please excuse me, I'm not that great at this Zoom screen sharing stuff. Um, please bear with me, I'm gonna try it one more time. I'm gonna try to not be foolish. Maiden Lane and Lower Manhattan, site of one of the most important events of the American Revolution on August 29th, 1776. So if we try to pretend... And ...that this is August 29th, 1776, well, it's raining like it is today, so that's pretty good. And Water Street is Water Street, but was the shore at that time. So looking across the street, the other side of Water Street would have been the shore of the East River. And we would be standing out on a little pier sticking out into the water. Now both to my, in front of me or to my right and behind me to my left would have been a whole sequence of commercial docks that lined the east side of the island. All of New York's commercial traffic went in and out through this part of the island and there would have been docks extending in each direction. And the dock that we're on, if I walk out here a little bit, 
faces Brooklyn or Brooklyn Heights and it's a little hard to see in the foggy rain which is kind of appropriate for the story I'm going to tell so we're going to be walking out to where today the shore is so that I can tell you this great story so I'm gonna say goodbye here for a moment and walk out to the shore and we'll meet up again there all right so I'm back and looking in the direction we came we walked about four blocks or about a quarter of a mile closer to Brooklyn um, up there is the FDR Drive and I'm gonna turn around here. In front of me is the East River, and across there in the fog is Brooklyn Heights. And uh, Brooklyn Heights is shrouded in a bit of fog today. I don't know if you can see it, but over there where the cars are going by on the Brooklyn Queens Expressway would have been the shore um, at that time. So for us, for our story at least, the East River is about a mile wide in 1776. Now down there to the south is New York Harbor, filled with those British uh, warships. And um, if we look around to the north, there's a pier blocking our view. Um, there's the masts of a 19th century ship here as part of the South Street Seaport Museum. And beyond that is up to the Long Island Sound. And of course, right over there is Brooklyn. Now on August 29th, 1776, Washington and his forces woke up over in Brooklyn Heights to find themselves surrounded by General Howe. Not only were they surrounded, but the British had built a massive moat surrounding them within artillery range of their cannon. Washington now has only one way out of Brooklyn and that's to cross the East River and not to cross where I'm standing remember but to cross all the way back there um, about three traffic lights in that direction so quite a long way to go and uh, the East River by the way is very deep here you can see the currents are strong and just like today it was rainy and the wind was blowing now the night before, Washington and his men, including Major Benjamin Talmadge, all assumed the British would attack the next morning, come directly up into Brooklyn Heights, um, arrest them all, try them for treason, and hang them right there. And a number of Washington's officers had even written their last wills um, in anticipation of that. But Howe chose not to do that and instead dig in for a siege on Brooklyn Heights. Now, coming up from the south, was going to be a warship, you know, dispatched by his older brother, Lord Admiral Richard Howe, which would block the Americans in right here. The Americans would be stuck in Brooklyn Heights and they would stay until they starved or mutinied against Washington or surrendered or whatever what would happen or whatever would happen. Um, so it really was not a bad plan on the part of the English, but look at the water today and look at the way the wind is blowing. And on that day as well, the wind was blowing so hard to the south, our right, that um the English couldn't get their ship into the East River. So Washington now is looking at a great escape route right across the East River to rejoin the rest of his army in Manhattan. Now they get word from Major General William Heath, who's up at the northern end of the uh, island guarding the Kingsbridge Crossing, that British ships have started to come in through um, the Long Island Sound, through the Hell's Gate. So the Americans realize that if they're going to move, they have to do it quickly. Washington sends out word for every type of floatable device to be gathered. Gathered. They're all brought here to Brooklyn and during the night in total darkness, there was no moon that night using no lanterns, they brought everything back to New York. And imagine how dark it would be here. There's no street lights, uh, no building lights. It's just total darkness. The guys who are gonna pull this off are a bunch of sailors from a little village called Marblehead on the coast of Massachusetts. There are the Marblehead Mariners commanded by Colonel Glover and Hutchinson. And uh, they're gonna man those boats and ferry everybody across in waves. So they'll come across dock way back there where we were standing before, unload what they have, and make their way back to Brooklyn Heights. Now in the meantime, um, a group of Pennsylvania riflemen, some New Yorkers, and Major, Je Major Benjamin Talmadge will be on watch facing the British troops, and they're going to keep their camps going all night so that General Howe doesn't figure out what's going on. And I think the best eyewitness account of this crossing comes from a pastor named Reverend Schaukirk, who said he stood out here on the pier as all manner of floatable vessel made its way back and forth across the water. He said carrying everything you could imagine from boxes of food, men, horses, cannon, tents, munitions. He said they would pile it all up to dry on the docks and head back for more. Now this proceeds in an orderly manner, as Benjamin Talmadge tells us, until morning comes 
and the men on watch begin to panic and make their way back to the crossing. They're stopped by General Washington, who sends them back, and they wait and they wait. And Talmadge says, incredibly, a thick fog begins covering the city and Brooklyn and the East River. It's so thick that they cover and almost to totally unable to see one shore from the other. I think Ben Talmadge said you couldn't see six feet in front of you. And miraculously, the fog stayed throughout the morning hours. They crossed everything back to New York. They didn't lose one man. They didn't lose a ship. They didn't lose a horse. They packed everything up, according to uh, Pastor Shao Kirk, all the way back there by Water Street. They packed everything up and they marched north, off to the right, north of the town. And uh, Reverend Schalkirk said that later that morning when the fog lifted, you could see the English walking around in Brooklyn Heights while the rebel army had completely disappeared. Um, Washington himself said it was divine providence we ought to have been taken at Brooklyn Heights. And think about it, had Howe followed the directions of some of his officers and marched on Brooklyn Heights instead, they would have taken Washington, five of his generals, hanged them all right there and caused massive disarray on the American side, perhaps even ending or at least delaying the Revolutionary War. So General Washington does the best he can do. He lives to fight another day and his next battle will be in a couple weeks at Kipps Bay and I hope you'll join me there on September 15th when we'll talk about the Battle of Kipps Bay. Thanks very much for watching. I'm Karen Q. Okay. So if some of you had a very keen eye, you may have spotted Mr. Q there for a moment <laughs> to reach into the desk to get something out. So uh, maybe some of you got a glimpse at uh, Mr. Q. So that is a really incredible story of the night of August 29th, the night we should all certainly remember. And you know, when you think about it, remember there were no street lights. Um, they were only, you know, using light of the moon to travel and they used no lanterns as, you know, when you're down there, you can see really how close those British ships were in New York Harbor and how easy it would have been for them to see them. But the, one of the, the, well, there are many things about this story that I just find amazing. The first thing I find that's amazing is New York City is filled with loyalists filled with people loyal to the crown. And somehow nobody gets word to the Navy right there in the harbor that this is going on. So that, first of all, to me is really fascinating. Another thing that's going on simultaneously to this crossing that's a little bit fascinating, if you are like me and very interested in the motivations of General and Admiral Howe, Admiral Howe that same night was having a dinner in the stateroom on his ship, the Eagle, for two captured Revolutionary War generals, Major General William Alexander, Lord Sterling, and Major General John Sullivan. So right while this was going on, Admiral Howe was entertaining two of Washington's generals. Very fascinating. And, and the reason he was entertaining them um, we'll be talking about, you know, when September comes around, is that he is looking for someone to go on his behalf to Philadelphia and offer a, um, a peace conference to the Continental Congress. And uh, Admiral Howe is asking these two generals if either of them would be willing to go do this on his behalf. And uh, um, Sterling, his whole family has um, major, seriously bad issues with uh, England. They are um, from Scotland and the family was uh, stripped of their holdings in Scotland. So of course, Sterling is not gonna do it. And I don't know how gentlemanly he was in his refusal, but um, Sullivan agrees to do this and Sullivan will go to Philadelphia and uh, make the overture on the behalf of uh, Admiral Richard Howe. And it was said that John Adams said that he wished the artillery fire of Brooklyn had blown his head off. He was so, uh, upset and angry at John Adams for um, becoming a messenger. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, John Adams was so upset with General Sullivan for um, offering to be a messenger for Lord Howe. 
And that peace conference will happen at the end of September out on Staten Island at the conference house. And I'm hoping this year to go out there dressed up as Mrs. Q to tell you the story of how that happened um, and what, what that was all about. But for now, it's August 29th. General Washington has done the best he can possibly do. He's lived to fight another day. The men of the American militia, um, the Marblehead Mariners have shown themselves to be more than worth their weight in gold. And you know they're going to do this again, right? On Christmas day, 1776, they're the same men who will man the boats for the crossing of the Delaware. But had they not been successful here at Brooklyn Heights, there would have been no crossing of the Delaware. And another great part of the story is part of um, Benjamin Talmadge recollection where he says that he got to New York and he saw that his favorite horse was still in Brooklyn and asked the commander if he could take a couple of men and go back to Brooklyn to retrieve his horse. He said he was given permission by the commander. He took a couple of guys and a, and a barge, I think a small barge. They went to Brooklyn, he got his horse, but he said when he was halfway across, the fog began lifting and the English were shooting at him. But he said, incredibly, he was out of range of their musket fire and on that one shot hurt them. And he was able to get back to Brooklyn um, with, the, I think it was two men who escorted him and his horse. And uh, they moved on and north of the town. And as I mentioned, the next battle in the battle for New York is the Battle of Kipps Bay on September 15th. So thank you all for joining me for this um, short live stream tonight. I'm just gonna take a look to see if any of you have, uh, yes, um, the Marblehead Mariners, the Indispensables by Patrick O'Donnell. Check the Francis Tavern Museum website because O'Donnell is going to be speaking there about the indispensables. I don't think it happened yet. I think it's in September. I'm not sure, but check the Francis Tavern Museum website because he is going to be speaking. You know, it's a, it's a virtual speaking event. So if you're interested in him or his book, you can check that out at Francis Tavern Museum. Let's see if we have any other. Um, I'm glad you guys all like this. Um, and I'm kind of doing this in conjunction with my walking tours because as you know, the city is a mess and uh, no one wants to come to New York and I don't really blame them. So uh, thank you for joining me and I will see you Friday. It's Mrs. Q. And um, I don't know, maybe I'll do a live stream about something else during the week, a surprise one. So you guys all have a wonderful uh, August 29th. And I think right about now it's dark here in New York City. And when I look out, I'm out my window, it's pretty dark. So I think right about now that crossing was probably starting. Um, um, the, this crossing was probably starting. Um, Jenny tells me she's writing the scene. Jenny, are you an author? Are you writing about the Battle of New York? That's that's really fantastic. That's great. Thank you. Um, I can't wait to see what you're working on. And uh, and for those of you, I have to tell you, um, you know, we are going to be doing a a. a costume reenactment of evacuation day. And just a hint, I do believe that accompanying Mrs. Q for that entire two tour will be none other than Colonel Alexander Hamilton. And I'll have more to tell you about that in the coming weeks. And of course, the October 1st tour with Mr. Madison is, uh, is on as well. So I'll see you all Friday. Um, keep looking. I'll probably do some sort of live stream during the week for you. And um, Oh, Jenny, I remember you now. I don't want to distract everyone with our conversation, but yes, I remember you now and good luck to you. Um, get in touch with me and let me know how you're doing with your book. Um, so I'll see everybody next Friday. Have an excellent week. And tonight, you know, when you go to bed and you lay down, remember the incredibly heroic acts of uh, George Washington, his men, and especially John Glover and the Marblehead Mariners. Good night to everyone and I'll see you soon.